Ladies and gentlemen, it's 9.30. It's that time again. Well, it may be that some people need more time to find this room. Um, let's start, and I'd be very happy to welcome you here to a joint session by the Dynamic Coalition on the Internet of Things and the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values, uh, chaired by uh, Olivier, standing there talking with Frédéric. And the first one and a half hour will basically focus on security aspects, the second one and a half hour basically on ethics uh, aspects. So with that, I'm trying to get the PowerPoint launched. As there's always new people in the room, uh, a little bit... Ah. Good. Uh, a little bit of framing, very quickly, because uh, at least half of you have seen this already. Basically, when we talk about the Internet of Things, uh, it's important that we uh, understand we talk about all the benefits it brings, uh, how much we need it, how much it's weaving into society already, and how much that will continue to be so to address big societal challenges, such as uh, more intensive use of our space, such as people growing older, uh, so as environmental challenges, extreme weather, etc. Uh, but also that, of course, it does come with threats as well. Technology is never good or bad in itself, is how we use it. And specific technology enable new good things and new bad things. So this is why Eight years ago, we, we started with, look, in 2008, so that's already 12, 11 years ago, we started to address this at uh, the IGF at the global level above silos, because there is where you look at the issues specifically. It doesn't mean it ends there. It's just a global view that can be taken forward locally uh, and into specific sectors. And that is increasingly done so. And we try to reflect back the best practice from that and uh, reflect forward what we think would be from a global level to address global issues, the, the, the real uh, challenges. Here at IGF specifically, it is very good to realize how much this relates and interacts to many of the uh, sustainable development goals that have been expressed to be achieved. Uh, zero hunger is, uh, I'll just pick out a, a couple, zero hunger is where you see that uh, IoT helps a lot to increase grab, uh, crops uh, returns, so crop management uh, by measuring uh, how much uh, moist is needed, by measuring which insects are there to fight. Uh, by, by really uh, getting more out of the country. Uh, and that's important uh, to also have that in a way that is, is affordable. So it's a combination of availability, affordability, uh, and not only in the Western countries that are technically advanced, but all over the world. And that goes on to clean water, where you can imagine that uh, water measuring helps, but also sustainable cities, where you can measure, uh, imagine that even traffic management is important. So all the different applications that have emerged over time vary a lot and uh, bring a lot, uh, ranging from tsunami buoy uh, measurements, so to predict tsunamis or earthquakes to come to Google Glasses that help you to connect to databases with your, with your cameras, um, to drones, um, and even to uh, stuff that nowadays we can carry in our arteries to measure our health. So the good practice principle that we've been working on uh, and that seems to uh, reflect a good balanced view from an IGF perspective is 
that it's about taking ethical considerations into account from the outset and find an ethical, sustainable way ahead using IoT to help to create a free, secure and enabling rights environment. The future we want, consciously working towards the future we want. In summary, the thinking of DCIoT is we want to keep IoT, we need IoT to keep this world manageable and to create that IoT environment uh, that also encourages investments in this to benefit from this is to invite all stakeholders to create a healthy ecosystem that automatically stimulates a healthy use of those tools uh, in which the feedback loop of awareness is, is crucial and uh, provide legal clarity. Yesterday in the main room we had a discussion about legal aspects, what law would you like to be there? Like with the internet, also for IoT, it's important to realize that much is already coded in law. It's just not coded for IoT environments. So to ensure that the IoT environment is developing in a trusted way, a way we're comfortable with or as comfortable as we can be, is that uh, the development uh, comes with transparency that is meaningful, that is understandable. Not loads of technical information, no. The right level of information to the right stakeholders. Clear accountability, who is responsible? One can imagine that for IoT use, for instance, in a car or in a plane, it's very clear who is responsible for the functioning. It's the, the manufacturer, it's the maintainer of the system. Um, and last but not least, real choice. So we can see that there are safer and less safe options. Um, but it's good if you understand the impact of that. And uh, in the end, it's people making choices to move things ahead. So again, part one that we start with now, momentarily, is what prerequis prerequisites are important from a security perspective. Uh, and what needs to be done to support a secure internet of things globally, across silos and geographies. And uh, after that we'll focus, so that's after 11 o'clock, uh, 11.30, to these factors. Uh, Olivier, would you like to say a few words about the core internet value take on this? Yes, thank you very much, Martin Olivier Clapin-Blanc speaking. And uh, the uh, second part of uh, today's double whammy, as one would call it, or double trouble, I don't know what the, the real name of it is. Uh, the second part will be taking on the discussions that we've had in the first part, uh, focusing on the IoT and uh, looking at the uh, core internet values, which uh, is a, a dynamic coalition that's been going on for quite some time, looking at the uh, what some people call the internet invariance, the values on which, the technical values on which uh, uh, the internet was built on. Uh, and we'll have a, a little presentation and a review of these values at the, the beginning of uh, uh, part two. Um, I think what's important is to try and, and get as much cross-pollination between the two, uh, the part one and part two. So we'll be taking notes of um, the uh, points that have been made in part one and then picking them up in part two, looking at whether um, any IoT related uh, discussions we've had might break core internet values. I know there are some people out there that believe that the internet of things is not the internet. And um, it'll be interesting to see if actually some people have this view here and if, uh, if others have a, a countering point of view. Um, and then after that, we'll, uh, we'll be looking at uh, how, how we can progress forward, perhaps collaborating further uh, with the, uh, the DCIoT and, and DC core internet values. Um, so I think that's, that's where we're going. We've got a number of additional panelists coming a bit later. Uh, and I, of course, invite everyone who's here to remain for the full it three hours until one o'clock. Uh, and we hope to be able to entertain you and perhaps even provoke you into uh, providing some input uh, at some point during the morning. Thank you. So and with that, uh, our rapporteur, Ryan Truplett, uh, here on my right. And Shane Chus will take over for me after five years of chairing this uh, the Dynamic Coalition. Uh, I'm very happy to, to have you here uh, and volunteered for that. It's been a deep pleasure. And uh, as in previous occasions, we also have the pleasure and honor of having Avri as our moderator for the first part. Avri, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. And I uh, want to welcome Shane, having passed the chair to 
Martin. I'm happy to see him having passed it on. Yeah, my name's Avri Doria. I apologize that I'm only going to be here for the first hour. I ended up being double scheduled and we'll have to run around to another dynamic coalition, at which point Olivier will take over on the moderating. So there's going to be a lot of, of shifting people here over the morning. In the first part, we're first of all going to start with a couple uh, statements from um, a couple folks. First of all, we're going to have Frederick Dunk, Dunk from the Internet Society. Then we have Marika Kao from ICANN Board SAC. Then Marco Hoja Vunning, and I'm apologies, I always massacre it, from RIPE NCC, and Max Sengis from Google will speak. So at this point, and then we'll basically open up the floor for comments, discussion, and what have you. So Frederick, please. Thank you, Avery. Um, and, and, and happy to be with you today. And I too have to apologize because I have also other schedules at 11, but I will stay. I will try to, to delay this because Olivier said he will keep entertaining us and I'm really interesting to, to speak about the core internet values and invariants. Um, so you remember the last time we spoke about this was in Paris uh, where I was giving uh, you the, the overall approach that the Internet Society took when it was about um, the Internet of Things, which is indeed when we talk about security a threat uh, to users, but also to the network. This is where we are interested, of course, <coughs> as well. Um, so the plan, as we developed the last two years, was to uh, uh, have a threefold approach, three big avenues. The first was to approach uh, manufacturers uh, and resellers um, uh, with the objective of having manufacturers embedding uh, security by design in their IoT device. And for this, we were proposing uh, the Online Trust Alliance principle, 40 principles that we trust would absolutely solve issues that we have met in the past. Uh, Examples are still very vivid uh, for some of you, like the more I bit about net, etc. Um, the, the other avenue was more um, an approach to consumers, uh, make sure that consumers understand the importance of uh, security when it's about <coughs> uh, the simplest example that we always take is uh, people buying precisely in the Mirai botnet case a camera and you just don't change the password it has changed me allowing uh, lots of people to use uh, your, your device uh, from outside um, and then the third was indeed approaching policymakers. For this, we have also developed uh, policy papers on privacy and security, which I would invite you to, to check. So now I'm happy to report to you that after um, the last, actually, 12 months, we were able to, I believe, achieve some very interesting uh, progress here, starting with um, this approach to uh, consumers and awareness raising. Um, we have, you might have seen this, um, um, agreed with Consumer International and Mozilla on five key principle, minimum principles that we would like to see um, uh, taken, not only taken into account, but implemented by manufacturers. So that was a very important step. I might recall you what those five um, minimum security standards where, uh, again, you will see that Mozilla, Consumer International Internet Society, are really strongly promoting those standards as the minimum. Encrypted communications for uh, any device, uh, security updates, that is the minimum. A manufacturer should give uh, the opportunity to consumers to know when is the next time your device will be uh, updated. Strong password. And of course, we hate password by default. Uh, strong password would be also to us a minimum standard for security. A vulnerability management and privacy practice readable by everybody. You should not be uh, a graduate from Harvard to understand the privacy settings of your IoT device. So um, from the policy side, we, um, as some of you know, we also led some effort with uh, who we identified as governments who really want to take the lead. So we spoke to uh, DCMS in UK, to the Uruguay government, to France with RCEP, um, um, to Senegal, 
in Africa. Um, um, and we succeed to have um, a, to build a platform of policymakers who want to continue promoting principles at a worldwide level. And of course, I forgot Canada, with which we also had a true multi-stakeholder process that we have led for the last three years with the Canadian government, but also the technical community there, businesses, and we have coordinated this. And again, I would invite you to check this, you Google Canada and IoT, and you will see that there are concrete uh, proposals for uh, standards, security standards for the IoT. So this platform that I mentioned is existing. Uh, um, it's composed of the governments, but also other actors, as Mozilla that, that I named. And again, it's been articulated on, on three strong principles that everybody recognize. Um, and that would be ensure that security is incorporated in all stage in the design of the device ensure that um, the personal data and critical data are being protected, and finally, giving the, ab the ability for users to delete their own data. More concretely, you will find that those principles will be concretely implemented in uh, vulnerability disclosure policy, a mechanism to securely update software, uh, etc. So, this is a very important step because now we have very prominent uh, stakeholders, including governments, who support uh, this approach and continue to do so on the platform. So that was, in a nutshell, uh, what we've done the last uh, 18 months uh, within the Internet Society. And I believe this is, um, well, not the end, but this is the beginning of, of uh, ensuring a more strong approach to uh, security standards for IoT. Thank you, Avery. Thank you, Frederick. And next, I'd like to ask Marika to uh, please take the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Avri. So, as Avri mentioned, I'm a member of the Security and Stability Advisory Council, and I'm the ASAN to the board. Um, the ESSEC undertook uh, some work to look at how uh, DNS uh, and the Internet of Things uh, kind of interact. And what, what we've largely found are that people don't really pay that much attention to how the DNS either gets implemented or really think about how to secure it. And because DNS can also be used for a lot of harm on the internet, there was a paper that was created. It's called, in short, SAC, which stands for uh, basically an ESSAC advisory, and it's number 105, where we talk about the opportunities, risks, and challenges. So a lot of measurement studies had shown that IoT devices use the DNS to locate remote services. Now, there's also uh, work in the IETF, uh, something called MUD, Manufacturer User Devices, I believe, where uh, you know, there's, there's also ongoing work where you might not have to use the DNS. But the DNS is used um, either by devices themselves, if they have enough uh, power and, 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 and processing power and all that, or they might use a gateway to translate names into, into the IP addresses, the numbers, so that devices actually know where to get their services and who to communicate to. Now, the opportunities here with the DNS is that when you're looking at security aspects, you can actually create more stringent security, stability, and transparency requirements, and I'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. But also, there are risks because if you don't implement DNS correctly, you can uh, accidentally stress uh, uh, the DNS, where if you have a large number of devices coming on, uh, let's say simultaneously after a power outage, or on purpose if you're uh, not that familiar with DNS and, and either implement it wrong. There's also a challenge in terms of how can the IoT industry seize opportunities and address these risks. So if we look at the opportunities and how uh, DNS can help actually protect and add more security, um, there are a lot of protocols and mechanisms where you can add privacy and confidentiality to somebody that's initiating a query, let's say a device that wants to go to certain services, either be it healthcare, be it, be it uh, uh, anything else that might, um, you don't want somebody to be aware of who's querying what service. So looking at whether or not you're going to use some of these privacy mechanisms when you're utilizing the DNS. 
There's also uh, using something called DNSSEC, which provides added security when you're using DNS because it makes sure that uh, nobody can actually create a fraudulent uh, uh, site that it's going to redirect you to, which is a cause of, of a lot of nefarious activities. Also, there's, you need to pay attention in terms of how you register domains and which domains you use. And when you're thinking about credential management, as uh, the previous speaker just mentioned, you know, using passwords, it's much better to do multi-factor authentication. There's way too many breaches to actually just uh, 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 trust the password these days. At least multi-factor authentication will give you a little bit more uh, uh, security. Um, and when we're looking at the risks to the DNS, um, there have been situations where there have been DNS unfriendly programming. So years ago, there was uh, an application called TuneIP where they had a software error and random queries filled uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, um, uh, the resolver. So basically the, the devices that would then give you back the information in terms of where you needed to go to and where, you need, where your applications needed to communi communicate to. And so it rendered it uh, uh, um, unusable. And the problem was that with this particular application, it took days before they actually had an update. Right, so a lot of services were down. Um, there's also, there's been larger and more complex denial of service attacks. So the DNS can be used for something called amplification, amplification attack, where if you're sending only one piece of information, one query, the way that it works, it might send 1,000 replies back. Okay, that's amplification. And so if you're improperly uh, implementing DNS, you can cause uh, amplification attacks. So we really want to pay attention to how you're implementing DNS. So the challenges for the DNS in the overall IoT industry is that uh, we may want to foster uh, uh, specific libraries or you know the fundamental programs that a lot of IoT devices can use to actually be more secure. Because one of the things uh, that's become very clear is that a lot of issues come from software also. And when, you, when you're dealing with uh, complex protocols, DNS is seemingly easy, but actually quite complex. And so are security mechanisms. And it's very easy to make mistakes when you're doing your software implementations. So wouldn't it be uh, very useful to maybe foster some opportunities to create these fundamental programs and libraries that uh, are created by, by, by not just a single entity, because you don't want a single point of failure, but some trusted entities that are really vetted and really thoroughly tested that can then be utilized. And also providing training to IoT and DNS professionals so that people really understand the fundamental of the domain name system how it works and the intricacies so that when they're implementing uh, the DNS service in their IoT devices that they don't make some mistakes that can really cause uh, insecurity and instability in our um, internet ecosystem. So I would recommend or hope that people will look at this paper um, because it does address quite a few interesting points regarding the domain name system and what needs to be paid attention to uh, when we're looking at the Internet of Things. And uh, it's called SAC 105, the DNS and the Internet of Things, Opportunities, Risks, and Challenges. Thank you, Marike. And I want to point out for the, for the transcript is that that was Marike Chaos speaking and neither Marilyn Cade nor the Republic of Korea to whom it was, was attributed. Perhaps it will get fixed later, but in the meantime, I just wanted to get that into the record. Uh, please, at this point, Marco, please, and perhaps you want to introduce yourself with the correct pronunciation of your name, and I'll try to learn it before I have to do it the next time. Yeah, thank you, Avery. Good morning. I'm Marco Hoogewoning, and, and it, it, it's really hard to pronounce. I don't mind. Just call me Marco, please. Um, so yeah, I, I, I work for the RIPE NCC. Um, uh, you might have heard of us. We're the regional internet registry for, for Europe and uh, Middle East and Central Asia. So we're mostly famous for uh, handing out IP addresses and, and distributing and managing the IP address space. Uh, 
outside of that, and that's mostly why I'm here, uh, RIPE NC also provides the secretariat services to what we call the RIPE community, which is a broad, um, yeah, multi-stakeholder group of European, Central Asia, and, and then Middle East network operators, service providers, uh, but also other stakeholders, so the governments, law enforcement, and uh, they meet regularly and have their own discussions about mostly network operations and, and the operational aspects of running the internet. Uh, so I'll mostly be addressing it from that perspective also, and, and to hook on to what Merike says, uh, we're one of the DNS operators, so we operate the K-Root constellation. Uh, now taking the IoT from that perspective, uh, I'm scared. I can echo Elliot Lear here, it scares the hell out of me. Uh, not only because Yes, uh, of course, looking future uh, security, especially when you look at like smart transport system, industrial IoT. Um, yes, that there, there's a high stake risk there. But also my feeling is that, that that part of the IoT is probably easier to control. We, we, we have better controls over the value chain in things like cars and things like industrial automation than we have in the domestic area, and that, that's where I really get scared, and that's also where a lot of the discussions in, in, in our field focus is the stuff you buy right now that is online, that you come home and that you plug into your Wi-Fi. Because not only it poses a risk to you, where my community is mostly concerned about, and we saw a brief sample with the Mirai attack, is how a lot of these devices can be used to actually attack and undermine the core infrastructure of the internet. The IoT will, in the worst case scenario, attack the infrastructure, it depends on itself and, and kind of become self-destructive. That, that's the worst case scenario. And what we've mostly been focusing on is that many solutions exist, like Frederick said, we've got, we've got very high level principles, we've got the values there. There are people talking to the different regulators, whether that is market access, get the vulnerable devices off the market or not on the market in the first place, but also towards like, what's the role of the access provider here? Because when it comes to safeguarding the rest of the network, the rest of the net from what happens in your home Wi-Fi, a lot of people immediately start looking at the access provider. But at the same time, what I hear from those access providers is, yeah, but we have things like net neutrality and we want to support an open and free internet. We want to be able to, to allow people to innovate. So we don't really want to police that border. But bottom line, these devices are out there now. Once they get sold, they'll probably live for another five to 10 years. So it is kind of urgent to do something and probably it can't be a single actor. So what I hope to get out of this discussion a bit at this level is also like everybody needs to do their thing, but we all have to sort of work in conjunction. Make sure market access for devices might be better secured, but also discuss like, okay, what can, from an access provider's perspective, what can you do to make sure that what happens in the home stays in the home and does not contaminate the rest of the internet? and for instance, attack my root DNS server and cause ma massive disruption to everything we do on our daily lives, including those uh, industrial automation systems. So that's a bit of where, where we stand. It's like, yeah, it's really two to 12. Some might say it's already too late if you look at the amount of crazy devices these days that we see in the market and, and that we know have known vulnerabilities. And as I said, it's many solutions that exist, but also solutions cost money and somebody has to foot the bill, which is another problem space there. It, it, it might be easy to implement software, but eventually it will cost somebody money. So, so that's, that's sort of the practical operational side of things. We need to do something and we rather do it today than tomorrow. I'll leave it, I'll leave it here for uh, discussion and questions. Thank you, Marco. And finally, of the pre-programmed speakers, Max, please. Good morning, my name is Max Senges. I uh, work at Google and had the pleasure of uh, joining most, I think, of the um, uh, Dynamic Coalition meetings over the years. 
Um, I bring the perspective of Google, which is, of course, uh, uh, also in that uh, DNS uh, um, sphere, but um, uh, the comments I make are mostly from our hardware perspective, so the uh, home devices, etc. And um, luckily uh, for me, the, the preparation for this was uh, fairly easy because we helped organize a workshop yesterday on IoT security. So rather than uh, you know, bring you something that's only from one perspective, I'm happy to report from that workshop and what we discussed. And uh, Martin was one of the panelists, so he can keep me honest if um, I'm uh, adding things or leaving important things out. Please, Martin. Do so. I would like to uh, point your attention to the IGF wiki, which is at intgovwiki.org, um, because we use that to um, both plan our session and update it. It's um, significantly easier than uh, updating the uh, official intgov um, forum website if you uh, had to try that. And so, um, yeah, we already uploaded our notes from the workshop. I want to um, jump straight to the conclusion, if I may, because uh, similarly to what we heard uh, here, and actually I'm, uh, I started a mail f uh, following up with the panelists, because this is, of course, very complimentary. I didn't know about um, the ISOC and uh, Mozilla initiative, for example. I think that's... Uh, very much spot on, and the IETF um, MUD initiative also stands for Manufacturer Usage Descriptions. I don't know if you had mentioned that. Um, uh, re really useful um, materials to, to build on. So I think um, before I go into the substance, I want to point out that um, this seems to be a space where the wheel is reinvented on a very regular basis, and uh, I would encourage us to see if we can um, maybe consolidate and bring together uh, a couple of efforts and, uh, and really um, move forward the security in the space. As pointed out, it's, it's really essential actually that um, we're, we're all safe in contrast to uh, um, other failures in the technology sector when we're talking about IoT. Uh, we're talking about uh, devices that can burn and um, crash and do other um, harmful things, so I think it's particularly adequate to um, start with safety and security. So, um, <clears throat> on the one hand, there were no surprises. We said that a mix of governance tools, technology, awareness raising, and uh, literacy instruments needs to be uh, need to be developed and deployed to promote security. Uh, importantly, regulation should be technology independent, so we shouldn't try to um, go um, in try to regulate individual devices happens over and over again. Um, of course, it is about the technology, it's about um, laws that um, enforce the security standards because sometimes that is necessary as um, I think is um, one example is the update of um, operating system software on mobile phones and other devices where the manufacturers just simply don't um, update the OS and the patches because either the devices don't even have that capability or it's simply a cost to um, a device that has already generated its um, value, its revenue for the company and then the incentives are obviously um, not high except for the good reputation or if it is indeed a violation of the law to update it. Um, the suggestion came up that uh, literacy and uh, making coding and security training part of the normal school education. Um, an interesting one is to promote independent testing. In, in Germany, we have um, Stiftung Warentest, which basically is a consumer protection uh, group that um, uh, is testing, um, uh, you know, different categories of devices, um, in this case not necessarily um, developing political pressure, but um, uh, publishing the results. And then when you see which devices um, are tested well from an independent source, that's, a, I think, a really interesting market mechanism to promote good security practices. Um, Promote security by design, including human rights considerations and the NIS directive on security by design was uh, pointed out. And um, uh, the idea that I personally like a lot and that seems like a good multi-stakeholder um, opportunity is uh, to come up with a sort of nutrition labels, what you have on all the food 
to identify what um, quality, what um, ingredients in terms of security and maybe also usability and other aspect uh, um, device has. And um, uh, I would invite, if anybody is interested to um, make that happen, uh, I would invite to, to have a conversation after this, or we can have a conversation with the chair or even uh, as part of this communication. The proposal for uh, best practices that um, were distilled was uh, obviously um, you know, one of the most um, dangerous things is default usernames and passwords and hard-coded ones. There's uh, plenty of evidence that that is really, really a bad idea. I, I'm surprised that that's not illegal at this point, actually. Um, uh, coordinated security updates. I've um, worked for several years on IoT interoperability. And um, you know, to make the things work together in the first place is hard enough. Um, uh, to include the uh, security and make that dovetail is, is even harder. In fact, it makes the interoperability um, of the usage harder that, is, um, that we're already struggling with. So I think um, the, the second point is really um, about cross um, uh, cross-stakeholder interoperability between uh, device manufacturers, the ISPs, the operating system provider, the various software pieces that um, make up a device. And then uh, those um, devices should be updated automatically in a regular basis. And um, also, uh, you know, something that I don't think is very widely spread, but please correct me if um, I've, I'm missing something, is a concrete end-of-life plan. People buy devices and think that uh, they last forever. They usually don't, and especially in terms of updates and um, expectation management for users, you should be aware whether um, you know, you're buying a second-hand device. Is that even still on an update plan, or is it already um, outdated? Those were some of the... Um, uh, ideas and, and um, uh, arguments put forward by the participants of the workshop yesterday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thanks all four for sort of plenty to worry about, plenty to think about, plenty to be concerned about, whether it's the device in your home is going to blow up on you or destroy the network or what have you. So I'd like to open the floor now to people that would like to question, like to comment, like to say something. Yes, Jimson, you're reaching for your microphone. Yes. Please, and please make sure you introduce yourself with your name, easily understood, so hopefully it gets put in correctly. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Jimson Ulufuyi, uh, Contemporary Consulting. Well, uh, the remarks so far have been excellent. They've been excellent when it comes to uh, IoT and uh, security in the future. Well, I, I would like to talk about a few improvements, possibly, um, to see whether you agree with me. Uh, when it comes to security, it's so key. Yeah, we've said there should be security by default. <laughs> but how about saying also that uh, uh, without the change of that default security, that device should not work? Because the default is all will be known eventually, you know, in some cases. So without it being changed, it should be possible that the device should not work. So that is one. And then uh, number two, with regard to accountability, yes, the possibility of destruction or the IoT destroying something is there. So, but we need to have in mind that, yes, yeah, as Martin said, there should be clear accountability that it is in our self-interest that these devices should be accountable to us. We need to have that clear understanding with regard to the design, with regard to the usability, that come what may, the devices should be accountable to us. So if we have that mindset, then uh, in terms of the design, there'll be no loophole, you know, that will get the, the equipment out of hand. And then uh, also predictability. So this should take us to where we can safely predict. So the concept of, oh, this thing could get out of hand will not even be there. We should be able to, it should be predictive, okay? And uh, there should be no leaks in 
terms of resilience, there should be no leak, and no leaks or back end. Uh, well, this does tell into big data anyway. So we need to be sure that uh, these devices, as I said, they are accountable. And no matter the amount of data available for them to permutate and uh, do some probabilistic uh, activities or produce some outcome, no matter what, it should, the outcome must account to us, must benefit us, and must uh, enable progress and not uh, reduce uh, the progress in the society. Thank you. Thank you. Marco, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, Jimson, thanks. And, 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 and yes, the accountability, but it, it, it kind of triggered my mind in, in something that I think is, is, is underestimated and, and not really discussed uh, anywhere. And, and it goes to Max's point about device lifetime, is the traditional way of punishing bad behavior on the internet is disconnect. It's a full disconnect. User really messes up your network you go and you unplug his DSL or fiber line until it's solved. Uh, there are two aspects there. A, with the IoT further proliferating in everybody's life, I might not have that capability from an ethics perspective, because disconnecting your house means disconnecting all your devices, your security systems, your medical devices included. So we might lose that capability, but at the same time, we're still not really discussing alternative approaches. If I know a certain class of devices is unsafe, if I know that a certain class of web webcams is responsible for attacks, are there effective means to take them offline, but selectively, but also en masse, where you can basically walk into a vendor and say like, either you fix your software or you now take all these devices offline, wherever they are which also is from an ethics perspective a huge risk, having such a massive red button. But, and I think that that's, I haven't seen that anywhere discussed. We, we talk about it, yes, accountability, yes, we need to secure these devices, but we haven't really thought about sort of the response if it turns out to go the wrong way. What do we do? How do we shut down whatever is causing the trouble? And then that's gonna be a bigger problem, as I said, because we become more and more dependent on that connectivity. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a remote uh, comment question. Yes, I can read it, but it's referencing an early speaker, earlier speaker. So the question is, IoT devices mostly have a cost of less than $5 and often $2. More will be built in China. Most will be built in China, sorry. Can we do what you are describing at that price? Do we have to include China to make this work? So would someone like to answer that? Yes, Martin. Well, it's a, this is a good point. Uh, so far we also talked about IoT as everything IoT is one, one and the same thing. Uh, and of course it's not. Yesterday we had the discussion, uh, particularly with Google as well. For instance, tags are also part of it, right? It, 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 it's the identifiers for even food nowadays. Uh, that goes into the system. And that is, of course, a different level than what we used to refer to as active IoT devices, which are those that are powered, that are actually broadcasting, collecting, etc. Uh, so I think that distinction is uh, very important to note that, of course, not everything uh, is equally sensitive and can afford equal uh, uh, security. On the other end of the spectrum, we know that some of the IoT devices, we don't need regulation or any pointing at because they're part of a bigger thing, like a car. And then the car manufacturer is, is responsible for having it properly integrated, otherwise it's liable. So uh, it's, it's really in that space where we need to find a way forward, as Marco said. Uh, it's also not always the, the device manufacturer that is responsible for things going wrong. It may be also be downstream, it may be even the user, although we shouldn't expect from the user to do things that are above his ability. So I think uh, the question is very good to make clear that IoT is not one blanket uh, name for all devices. No, it stands for connectivity uh, to the internet of different uh, sorts of devices. 
Thanks. I have all four of our previous speakers wanting to comment. So, Max, what would you like to add, please? So, um, it, it's almost more of a question than um, uh, an answer, but um, what you just said made a lot of sense to me about the different classes of devices, and I'm actually fairly surprised, uh, and at least I don't know, but maybe uh, someone else does. Why don't we have different classes of devices, like standardized classes of devices, from passive to you know, very unsecure um, little thing to an Airbus um, plane, right? I mean, there, there is a big spectrum of different um, uh, devices. And yes, we have individual certificates and things that indicate the, the level of security, but not just a very basic breakdown of um, uh, things so you could even say, you know, I, I'm, I only want to connect to, to save things or only to a certain class of devices. It seems to be a, a very useful distinction. America, you wanted to add something, please. Yes, um, and I'll build on what Max was just saying, because uh, in, in numerous discussions over the years, I have heard about classification of different devices, and it's very critical to also understand that security needs to be looked at holistically. So every single device in my home does not have to have security if I have separate networks, VLANs in a more technical term, and really you know, funnel it through a gateway that will then handle all of the uh, security items or protect my home with all the different devices that I may have. And this may be true for other uh, uh, IoT-related aspects also. So I think it's very, very important that we actually classify uh, the devices, where they're used, and what other mechanisms can be utilized to provide the security functionality that actually would, would not be uh, a, a real realistic thing in the device itself. Thank you. And Frederick, you wanted to add something. Yeah, uh, but, but, but uh, <laughs> some of the speakers before me already provide the answer that I want to give. So building on what Merica just said, and, and I agree with you. Um, Many times when we're discussing um, IoT, people refer to smart devices, and, and I couldn't agree less with this reference. I mean, in most of the case, um, the devices are just fairly stupid. Um, those are just devices uh, with a caption, they receive data, they resend data, but the real intelligence is somewhere in the cloud. So in most cases, we need to see IoT devices and smart devices as very stupid devices, but there is an ecosystem where the intelligence is. And this is why I believe that we need to address issues of security with that ecosystem in mind. Yes, the market is very volatile. Um, the, 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 the question was about a device important from China at a very low level. Indeed, it's very easy to squeeze a chip of one dollar into a doll and call it a connected doll. And what it is that you do with this? Uh, regulation won't be able to address this because each time there will be a regulation, there will be another product that will escape that regulation and even that classification. So I believe we need to address the whole ecosystem, including the fact that you are connected to internet and this is why. I agree with Mary Kay. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. And at first I thought I had lied about all five of the previous speakers wanting to, but Marco has come through with a request to comment to make me a truth speaker again. Truth speaker again. Yeah, thank you, Ravi. No, this this very briefly because I, I I do indeed think that yeah, classification might help. Um, we also that's a bit of like uh, mud that was mentioned is 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 part of doing that. It kind of makes sure that a device is limited to a certain level of capability and can't can't step out of that boundary. It's helpful, but I don't think it's the only solution. And you already mentioned mentioned Airbus, and, and I'm not at liberty to discuss any any real details. But but from conversations I had with, especially the aerospace industry, you look there are many threat vectors, there are many threat models, many vectors there. But one of the principal points there is that one of the biggest risks is the maintenance engineer's laptop, because he has full access to the systems. You can, you can design your aircraft as safe as possible and super secure, but somewhere some guy's going to step in with his Windows or Mac laptop and just plug it in <laughs> right into the core of that system. And, and that's a massive security breach from, from 
a gap perspective or a classification perspective. Uh, back to your point about device cost, and, and I mentioned that in my opening statement, yes, somebody has to foot the bill. And, and, and it, it might sound strange to come out of a ripe NC employee's mouth, but I do think that regulation there is the only option. We have to set minimum standards, and those minimum standards have a cost. If you allow the cheap device to be on the market, people will buy the cheap device, no matter what label you put on it. If, if, if we think it's unsafe, it should not enter the market, and there are compliance regulations that we can enforce there. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Laurie. Laurie Schulman um, for the International Trademark Association. I just have a, a question about classification. I find this really interesting. Um, so are you talking about ISO classification? Are you talking about industry classification in and of itself? Or are you talking about the end user classifying what may or may be in the home in terms of ranking the security preferences? So I, I, I find the as I said, I think it'd be interesting to, when you talk about classification, what levels we're discussing. I didn't uh, pick and choose either of those. I, I just thought that from the conversation and from um, Martin's answer, that seemed like a, a useful path to go down. What, what do you think? Yeah, that's actually that's what made me start to think about it. Exactly. Like, where where do we go, or do we have an international standard setting for this classification? Do it, or do industry um, take it upon it as a socially responsible practice to classify? And then getting down to the, the end user itself, you know, in my home, which of my devices I consider high or low risk or preferenced or not preferenced in terms of how you switch it on and off. And I do get concerned as an end user when we talk about core values, human rights, this idea that I may not be able to opt out at all. And if I can't opt out at all, do I even understand what that means in terms of labeling? You know, is the label going to the manufacturer, the engineer, is the label going down to the end user? I see this as multi-tiered and multi-level based on certain levels of, of, of risk. Thank you, Laurie. And, and I've been a terrible moderator in not calling on people by name, so the transcriber has been losing it. So that, so basically, I had Marike and Marco and Shane wanting to comment on this. So, okay, okay and then, okay. Uh, so, Marike, please. And, and do give your name again, just to make sure we get the transcripts right. Okay, thank you. It's Merike Keo. And um, yeah, I, I think the classification isn't as simple as it might seem, right? Because the criticality, if you have an Internet of Things device that can be both in a hospital or in a home, right? I think then you have to think about, well, how does it get used? and where might the criticality change because of where it is used, right? And so I know that there have been different efforts of classification, um, and one of the things that's a challenge is to see globally, right, who's doing what, who's doing these classifications, and how are they being utilized, because it creates confusion if you've got different islands creating different classifications that then if I, who is a global entity buying these items, let's say I'm a corporation or, or some you know, en energy sector entity or, or a car manufacturer, who knows what, that really uh, it, it would be nice to have some kind of a cohesive standard so that also when you're certifying these devices, there's, there's cohesiveness because right now we don't have that yet. But who's going to be the body that will provide that cohesiveness? Right, that's, that's also something to really think about and, and define. Thank you. I have Marco, Shane, and then Gunella. Yeah, the, the, the practical mind, and as, as Merrick said, there are, there are several certification schemes in, in, in order here, whether it's ISO. I mean, from a European perspective, everything has to have that, that, that famous CE mark and different classes of products have different requirements. But what I think is also good in mind, and then Mary earlier on whispered sort of like your yeah, airworthiness, yeah, to, to look kind of maybe at the internet worthiness. And again, it's a cost, but before we sell a car, we throw a few against the wall to see if they actually live up to security standard. Most, most of the IT certification is a paper exercise. 
maybe we should and and it, this destructive tests are expensive and it will ruin your time to market but yeah maybe we should sort of throw a few devices against the virtual wall before we put them into the market and and sort of demand real pen testing to happen for instance and and make sure that it's not only on paper it's secure but according to the current threat level, we actually think it's, it's secure enough to hold up to whatever we can throw at it. Thank you. Marco, Shane, please. I, I really like the idea of classification because I think we need to divide a little bit to your point, Lori, um, consumer items versus things that are happening in the enterprise or in the industrial area. We have um, had a couple pieces of legislation that I've reviewed in the uh, Senate, and one of the challenges I had with the more senior senator was explaining to him that you can put a seal on a box, but the minute that thing comes out of the box and there's an update, it, we don't know where it is in the system at that point, or we, we know where it is in its life cycle. So I think you guys have made a, a lot of good points. I hope that we will follow up on this year, and so I hope you all continue to participate. And I also have a question that I'm just going to, so I have the microphone, is is, is there a um, any information sharing that's going on globally? I'm thinking about the way we use industrial ISOCs just to make sure that, uh, Jimson, you, I can't remember the phrase you used, but pro like the problematic activities, I think you said, where we know when something is getting noted, you know, are we sharing that beyond uh, the borders of where the actual issue is taking place. Thank you. Uh, Gunella, please, and then we can come back to, to the question that's been asked. Thank you, Avri. Gunella, Spring, incoming MAG member, NOV, Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. Um, these, these discussions are really important for people with disability and older people uh, in regard to uh, smart homes. Um, it's a way for um, people to be able to continue to live independently if there are uh, smart devices uh, that can assist them uh, on a daily basis. But there needs to be interoperability, and we've already heard about that uh, in regard to any other assistive devices. Uh, there also needs to be um, accessible interfaces. Um, friendly interfaces that work for people who um, are not tax savvy at all, certainly older people, maybe people with cognitive disability. Uh, so all of those things need to be taken into consideration um, together with um, the, um, the classification I found was very interesting because there are uh, significant vulnerabilities uh, with a number of people who live independently and uh, we need to consider how that classification works for people with disability and older people. We, we um, organized actually a, um, a workshop two years ago here um, on IoT and uh, persons with disability and accessibility and we're very pleased Martin and then Surf could present there. So there, I know things have moved on a lot but uh, I just am keen to ensure that uh, accessibility is uh, incorporated in any of these discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Before uh, going on, I'm going to, I'm going to pass the, the, the moderation, because unfortunately, I'm really quite enjoying this, but unfortunately, I'm responsible for the Dynamic Coalition on Schools and Internet Governance, which happens shortly, and I'm the one that's supposed to do that one. So I just want to say, though, I'm really quite impressed by this and how it's going as the person that was the second uh, chair of this DC. Uh, I really love the way it's blossomed and the way it's gotten into stuff. So continue to have an enjoyable session. Olivier, it's you. You had Thomas and then Max. Thank you very much, Avery. Olivier Crépin Blanc speaking and uh, well done. So I'm going to try and, and keep up the pace. Let's go for Thomas uh, Rickard next. Thanks very much, Olivier. This is Thomas Rickard uh, speaking for Eco Internet Industry Association. And I think that uh, this discussion is most interesting, but we're discussing different levels of the discussion, from the manufacturer to the network operator to other aspects such as accessibility and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, I think that everything starts with the manufacturer. 
And um, there have been initiatives to talk about ethical development of software for IoT devices going back to at least 2013. There's this great presentation, Swimming with the Sharks, that many of you will be aware of. And there was a suggested Hippocratic Oath for those who de develop software for medical devices. And I think that more needs to be done in order to get the developer community on board with developing software that actually has all the ingredients that uh, promise for devices to be as secure as they can be at the time of uh, publication. Um, and I'd, I'd like to, um, uh, for those who don't know it, but ENISA, um, uh, the uh, European Union Agency for Cybersecurity has just released a couple of days back a uh, 130-page document, Good Practices for Security of, uh, of IoT, and that describes the secure software development life cycle in its entirety at quite a detailed level. So I think that's a very good read for those who are interested in, in, um, uh, in um, software development aspects of, of IoT security. So I think that's, that's, that's one aspect. I think you, we need to encourage the developer uh, community uh, to take certain principles uh, on board when designing things. But at the same time, I think it's also important to have some deterrence maybe at the regulatory um, level. You know, we have product liability laws where you can't just throw something out into the market and leave it, leave it there. But uh, those who, uh, who, who um, uh, sell devices, and Gartner predicts that in 2021 we're going to have 35 billion dev IoT devices out there. So it's a, it's a massive uh, uh, problem that, that we're facing. Uh, to get to hold those accountable that actually um, uh, submit products to the market that are not ready for uh, for market or shouldn't be uh, sold um, at all. Um, um, uh, final point, I think, um, or two, two additional points, if I may, on on the um, uh, DNS uh, aspect of things. Eco is going to push uh, or try again to push DNSSEC. We've done quite a bit in the area of DNSSEC, but it's, it's difficult to, to get people on board with that. We're going to push uh, DNSSEC for IoT in, in, um, in particular in, to, in 2020. And also, I think we need to come up with different approaches to responses to IoT issues. You know, we, if, if, we ha if we have a household where the toaster goes rogue, right? Uh, you, you might not have somebody uh, who can actually help you with that. So I think we need to rethink responses to IoT issues uh, because, you know, the, the system that we have at the moment where you just go to the, to, the, to the vendor or you go to the access provider, I think it doesn't work uh, as it previously did. So we need to come up with new responses. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Just one point you mentioned here, the product liability. Obviously, that works with uh, physical products in the physical world, but often software, and of course, IoT devices is all about, well, a large component of it be being uh, software. Software vendors often accept no liability whatsoever for anything related to the software. How can that work in the context that you've mentioned? Uh, well, certainly I don't have the silver bullet solution, but uh, when it comes to chemical ingredients, we have uh, uh, regulation that requires you to make sure that, that, um, that the products that you use or the ingredients that you use are, are not causing any dangers to, to the individuals using them. And I think that for, for IoT, you can apply certain design principles that can be tested at the time of release to the market. Um, and I think that, um, that, the, that the manufacturers should be held accountable to, uh, for the products that they're allowing for, uh, for being entered into the market. So I, I think you can, while software is being developed uh, further, there are updates, and somebody said earlier that um, uh, uh, that causes an issue because products that are safe uh, when you uh, when you publish them might not be safe with the, with the first update, or they might, their vulnerabilities might might become known later on in the process, then we have an additional issue with uh, discontinued products. You know, who's going to take care of those where the manufacturer doesn't really want to, uh, uh, to continue supporting products? But I think at the time of submission to the market, there's, there should be certain principles or standards that should be met. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Next is Max Sengis. I just wanted to uh, add two points. Uh, one is that uh, the Charter of Trust that was uh, launched last year at the Munich Security Conference 
uh, seems to be a, a relevant uh, stakeholder in all of this and quite active, and um, I'd be happy to um, uh, make a connection for the chair or so to, uh, um, to include them in this conversation. Basically, the Charter of Trust aims to have a secure production pipeline of um, connected devices. So um, it's, it's kind of a um, mechanism to, to go really uh, step by step for all the different um, uh, participants in the supply chain. And um, uh, the other observation um, uh, that I wanted to share was that um, uh, I think it was Marike who um, uh, brought up that <clears throat> we should have this classification be as the central, like central, but um, in, in one place, but organized by different parties. That seems to be uh, quite related to the second option um, that uh, for how internet governance should develop that was um, recommended in the high level report on the age of um, uh, interdependence, where they're saying, in my interpretation, if uh, the internet is eating the world, then um, all, in very soon all of uh, the world will be internet governance. And that um, we have to start to look at sectorial approaches and uh, think about internet governance for uh, finance, internet governance for mobility, etc. And if the classification was done by the respective sector, so health devices should um, define their security standards uh, for themselves, mobility providers should define theirs for their, their area, then you would have that decentralized but coordinated approach. Uh, thank you for this, uh, Max. Uh, God forbid having everything internet governance will probably have a, a three-week or four-week IGF. Quite unsure. Uh, I've got Marike Kewa first and then uh, Marco. So Marike. Sorry, Marco. No worries. No worries. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to address the question earlier about are people sharing information of is issues. Um, from my perspective, IoT devices are used in various sectors, right? The automotive, airline, maritime, healthcare, energy sector. So I would expect some discussions, at least within the DEF and ISAC, uh, uh, the information sharing between sectors uh, or within a sector. Um, but what, what I am personally concerned about is transparency of issues. Um, I had a conversation just the other day with somebody that was from a different region. I wouldn't be able to stand the, uh, understand the language in terms of any news articles, but apparently there's been some engine fires uh, in cars that were due to a software issue. Right? And so, I mean, we really need to understand, and from a security perspective, I've been in the security industry for 20 years, People are not very good at being transparent about security issues because people get vilified. There's all this hype, and so one of the issues in security overall is that people are not transparent. It's either liability, the shaming, and that has to change somehow. And I am quite worried about uh, you know, what's not transparent in terms of IoT uh, insecurity aspects and issues. And then I also want to just make a statement on the design principles. Um, so I bought a television quite a few years ago and then I realized when I came home that it's an Android device, right? And so the first thing I did was look through all the screens to see what's being sent where and what. And then I was really happy that it actually provided updates but it would take up to 30 minutes. And it does take 30 minutes. And so, you know, when we're creating these design principles, sometimes we might want to get into a little bit more detail in terms of, you know, you must do it in a timely manner. Because sometimes if you're too ambiguous, then it's really not that useful either. Uh, thank you for this, Marike. Next is Marco Hogawonik. Thank you. Well, Marike added, added, added several things now spark into my mind. First of all, to your last comment, yes, we also see that in the industry, is that your uh, maintenance windows become harder to plan, and they're absolutely essential. You have to allow certain things to be shut down for an hour or two to just do the upgrades you need, otherwise face the consequences. But um, to build a bit on the, on the previous discussion around like liability, and, and, and you made a good point, and, and, and transparency as well, because we do see a lot of European directors now that ask for reporting. But what I hardly ever see is getting anything out of that reporting chain for us to learn about. And, and, and that appears to be like every time we see an incident, the root cause is often the same. And that's, and that's something where we might want to take an example in the airline industry where um, invest, 
accidents are investigated, but also a lot of the incidents and near misses are thoroughly investigated and then published to learn from. In that sense, an aircraft disaster is almost always pretty unique in its root cause because by the time we've done analyzing it, the root cause is addressed and we can fix it. Uh, Back to your original point in terms of you like yeah user exclusion I did I did a bit of I had to for, was forced to look into it but for instance the European Radio Equipment Directive is 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 pretty firm in 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 sort of making sure that there is always somebody liable whether it's the person selling it to you the person importing it or ultimately the manufacturing that that's that's there. What it doesn't cover yet, and I know there are discussions there, is how long that liability exists, and that goes back to product lifetime. And, and, and that's what worries me a bit, is that often, especially in, in sort of the cheaper end of the device spectrum, uh, the device lifetime is often longer than that of the manufacturer, and we need to solve that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Marco. Uh, Olivia speaking. One of the points, actually, that in some UK discussions was the fact that if you purchase a refrigerator, it might actually have a lifetime of 20, 30 years because it's a fairly simple device. But are you going to ask the device manufacturer to provide updates for the next 30 years, especially given that often they have a shelf life of a year and a half? So there would have been dozens and dozens and dozens of devices with their proprietary software, etc. Mirike mentioned a little bit earlier the transparency of the, the, the software uh, and the, uh, you know, I guess one of the question is is because the software is often or, or most of the time is proprietary is there any way to actually ask for transparency regarding what the software features really are in a device because often devices get um, and I'm throwing that to pretty much everyone here devices uh, uh, get shown a, a number of uh, features when it comes down to software but there are often hidden features as well any thought on this Martin the show Okay, well, basically, we look at a lot of the same things that we look at with, with apps and with uh, Internet Matters backdoors, uh, apps that if they install them on your mobile, that they uh, facilitate sharing your base of contacts and your base of uh, calls, etc. Um, the latter is nowadays more and more watched and checked and double checked. And I think we'll see this with IoT devices too, and it's necessary. The next thing is that you come down on those who built that in. So I think uh, it's a matter of maturity and a very important issue to, to, to tackle. OK, thank you. Any other comments on, on the points that have been discussed this morning? So I, I have one. Give me to jump the line there. Okay, okay. Shane. No, just, and then going back to the very beginning of the conversation about working with governments and regulatory ideas, um, how are we doing with the procurement process? Because sometimes the dollars will help change, uh, you know, policy. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I know I've been doing it with the U.S. government. Is there a procurement process? Uh, yeah, uh, Jimson, maybe. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jimson speaking. Well, that is a, a fact, you know. At the point of procurement, you can really make uh, significant changes. So I think this needs to be uh, really amplified uh, such that uh, based on even the requirements, specification, normally you put in your product description in the, the order you want to uh, purchase. And those product divisions should be able to classify the kind of category, talking about category of devices, what you want, and the, the level of security measure. Uh, I've seen a, a number of devices that you put EU something, they put EU, they put uh, uh, some form of categorization, I've seen them. In fact, in Nigeria, they will say you should watch out for some label. Okay, so we could get to that level whereby we we'll say, maybe uh, AU or EU or other bodies could have some form of basic uh, categorization. And if that is met, that is when the product can be certified, you know, to be in compliance with the order. So it's a very major point, okay? So uh, this, the, the demand side can actually make that demand. And also, with regard to, you, you said something with regard to how do we correlate 
you know, all the various you know, regulation. So this brings us back to uh, what we need to do at the global level, okay? Uh, Self-governance has been happening at the various manufacturer level, maybe associations, some associations are doing a good job of it. But it's been kind of fragmented, so we need to have a way to coordinate this. Okay, so how do we really uh, do that? Which organization will get that done? Uh, maybe uh, when we come to the data governance session, I'll be talking more about you know, underscoring the need for us to have that global framework. Because it's very necessary. The next level where the world is going to now is going to be very decisive because a rogue uh, authority can, or rogue manufacturers or rogue users can manipulate a lot of these devices. So we need to have that in mind. Uh, otherwise, we are moving to a trend show where uh, if we have to now unplug, like Marco said, if we have to unplug, that's the basic measure. When you see a rogue actor, you turn it off. But that also causes damages. So we need to look at those effects down the line. So I agree with you. Procurement is part of it, but the bigger uh, uh, thing we need to focus on is how do we tackle this at the uh, global level. Thank you. Thank you, Jimson. I have quite a few hands here. So Klaus Stoll, uh, Frédéric Donk, Marco Hogowonik, and, oh goodness, even more, uh, and with, with Laurie Schulman and then Matthew Shears. Uh, let's start with Klaus, please. Okay, very quickly, we have the right uh, to be forgotten. Maybe we have the right to be switched off and maybe the right not to be dissolved any longer. Thank you. Uh, next is Frédéric Donk. Yeah, very quickly to react on the procurement uh, space. Uh, this is one of our advice and recommendation in this paper I refer to uh, IET security and policy. We, we, th there should be an environment where government indeed use this very powerful um, uh, instrument that are procurements. Uh, I haven't seen this yet for the IoT device security indeed. You may remember that INISA uh, already five years ago, I believe in 2014, issued a recommendation and guidelines for procurement in ICT security generally. So I believe this is something, yes, that should be absolutely leveraged. Thank you. Thank you, Frédéric. Next, we have Laurie Schulman. Oh, Martin? Uh, it's, it's a two-finger if it is allowed, but basically uh, the Dutch government has made that part of the package of their approach towards uh, more secure IoT environments explicitly. So they uh, put standards for procurement in the uh, procurement uh, policy. And I think that's an example that is worthwhile following because you set an example by uh, really making it attractive for uh, IoT makers to come with good tools, good services, and they already have a market. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Laurie? Laurie Schulman, I, um, my comment goes less to procurement and more to the refrigerator that might last 30 years and the software that lasts 18 months. Perhaps um, at the policy level for, use, for goods used in the home, consumer-based goods, we think about modularity, and it also kind of, it goes to Klaus's comment about switching it off. So perhaps the standards that we develop about consumer, consumer goods in the home is that nothing is necessarily auto automatic, right? That you could have modul modular devices, modular updates, modular, literally modular pieces. If I want to stay connected, I put my, my card in. If I don't want to stay connected, I pull my card out. It, it seems f fairly easy. I understand that's more complicated in, in heavy machinery and, 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 air, and, and airplanes, but it should be relatively simple for your toaster or your refrigerator or even for Alexa, pardon me, but that there could be moments when you can just pull out your programming. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. And, and it might seem to be something quite obvious, but you often see devices these days that require you to log in before you can even use the piece of software, uh, especially apps. I, I'm going to respond to that by saying I think that they're at all levels, and including of my own members, who, who most of my members are, are um, 
manufacturers, corporations, service providers to inform their consumers of that. And for consumers who don't want this to opt out of it. And I will say it is a, a very frustrating um, situation. And I think some of us too, and I'll, I'll speak from a very personal experience because it was kind of shocking. I use a medical device at home. I replaced it. The one that I replaced it with was IoT. It was not disclosed to me. It was, I was not trained on it. I was not trained on how to program it. There was just this assumption that it was going to go ex somewhere extraneous and they'll be looking at the data. And then it was a little shocking because I was receiving emails. Congratulations, you've met your, your health goal for this week or this month or whatever. Um, so there's a question too about, and I'm an, I consider myself an informed user. So if, if, if I'm not understanding what I'm buying, and I'm not understanding where I can connect and disconnect. I think that, that again, when we're talking about core values and fundamental human rights, that, 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 that that's at the heart of, of many of these issues. So when we talk about policy initiatives, we can talk high level, procurement, but I think we need to get very basic in terms of those that are bringing devices into their home and don't even know they, they have the software embedded. All right, thank you, Laurie. I'm seeing the time uh, take, so I'll close the queue after the two speakers that are still in the queue. Next is Marco Hogwinnick. Yeah, and, 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 and I wholeheartedly support you, Sean, in, in terms of yeah, using the government's purchasing power, that's always a great incentive. But in this particular case, I'm not sure we're there yet. Because I'm, although we do have a lot of safety standards and product conformity, I'm not sure they're up to scratch for the IoT. Uh, back to Laurie's comment, um, it, it sounds very aspirational and I love it, but I also think of myself as a user. The easier it is, the, the, I don't want to punch in codes, I don't want to move devices in and out, I just plunk a fridge in, in a corner and it's going to be there for 20 years. And, and I don't want to hassle with it, and probably a lot of my, a lot of my friends want, don't want to hassle with it. So in that sense, again, the ego is like, I think we have to be open and frank about it. Do we want that device on the market in the first place? If it's such a hassle to keep it secure, maybe don't. And, and I mean, I'm a cook myself. I recently tried to buy a new digital thermometer. It's almost impossible possible to find one that doesn't do Wi-Fi. Uh, I finally found one that only does Bluetooth, that limits its possibilities, but it, it, it's really hard to find like an old-fashioned digital thermometer that doesn't have a chip on board and a radio device. It, it, and it, it annoys me. What, why? Why would a digital therm thermometer do Wi-Fi? I've got an absolutely no clue. The old one was perfectly fine with a wire. Uh, thank you. Matthew Shears. So just on the procurement issue, um, in terms of um, in encouraging uptake of IPv6, um, there were number, numerous requirements put into procurement processes to ensure that devices were IPv6 enabled. So that's, that worked in that context. I'm not sure what the actual impact was over time, but, but certainly that was one of the requirements that was placed in, put in place by a number of governments. But I wanted, to come, I wanted to add a dimension here. This has been a discussion that has the flavor of a very developed nation discussion. Um, and there are, when we think about IoT and we think about security divides between nations and we think about the degree to which IoT and other technologies are being pushed around the globe as ways of improving economic development, we may have more than just a CE certification problem, we may have a much broader problem, much more global problem when it comes to rolling out these kind of networks. What we may have is certain parts of the world that are quite secure or may have secured their IoT networks and we may have others that may not and that still has implications for the global network and it still has implications for the internet. So we need to think a little bit broader. I mean, it's, it's multi-level, it's multi-dimensional, but it's also um, very much a global challenge. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Now, are there any actual remote participants? That, is there anything on the uh, remotely, any additional points? Okay, so I guess I can turn the floor over to Martin to sum up the, the session, or should we introduce the next one? No, I, th I think uh, uh, Matthew squared the circle with his remark that uh, it's not only thinking about securing the material, but uh, IoT devices are needed also in other parts of the world. Uh, very clear is a warning against uh, extreme weather 
uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, but also for crop management, etc. And that means that it doesn't only need to be secure enough, but also indeed affordable, and we need to find uh, that way there. Uh, capacity building, that kind of elements uh, of how to deploy this. <coughs> because we can think of how to deploy these, but the best thing is to help local, regional uh, stakeholders to, to, to use these tools that have become available now. So uh, I think that's a very worthy uh, rounding off. Uh, I think the main things we had is uh, the realization that we talk about all kinds of classifications, active versus passive, uh, whatever application uh, they refer to, whatever part of the world they used in, uh, that it's important to actively address this by informing consumers, uh, people knowing what to do, uh, but also don't expect too much of him as, uh, from them, as uh, Marco said with his consumer head on as well. Um, and that to serve the world, and this is very much from an IGF perspective, it's important that we make them affordable and available for all parts of the world that can benefit from it. So I, I'm again very happy with the discussion, and I saw Shane type very enthusiastically, so I wish you so well, and I hope to be here uh, participating in the contribution as much as possible still. You're not completely leaving us, I hope. You're going to still stick around. Um, thank you all for a very uh, uh, enthusiastic discussion on this, because I think we are at a point where some changes can be made in the technology, and now would be the time to be doing it before we have all these devices in and no one knows how to disconnect them. So um, I, I look forward to the, the report, and I hope that everyone will continue to be with us on this dialogue as we go forward. Thank you. So uh, this uh, pretty much signs the end of the first uh, part, but there's a second part of this discussion because this is a back-to-back -back session. We will give you 30 minutes to take a break, think a little bit, get a bit of fresh air from outside and perhaps some coffee and biscuits and so on. But the second part will uh, go a little further into the core internet values. And one of those values is permissionless innovation, the whole point that you're able to provide any service of any kind, or supposedly any service of any kind, and that will be carried uh, on the internet. We've heard from a number of people that perhaps there should be some ways to get those devices that are dangerous or that uh, are uh, somehow threatening or, or open or un insecure to be disconnected. Are we going back to the, uh, uh, the years of telecommunications where you needed to have devices uh, to be accredited by your local telco, pay lots of money? Are we going back in this direction? Are we killing potentially permissionless innovation? Um, so the question is, for the second part, I guess, is uh, do we need more regulation or can an ethical framework uh, for manufacturers, for uh, service providers, uh, take us to uh, something a little softer than uh, hardcore legislation? We'll have several other panelists that will join us, uh, Alejandro Pizanti being uh, one of them. Oh, 